you know, well. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak here. So this is joint work with Yoav Len, who spoke yesterday. And in a sense, my, uh, my talk is a continuation of his talk, but I don't want to assume that you're uh, there for his talk yesterday. So I just want to begin with a few, um, ba oh, a few basic definitions. So tropical geometry is a kind of combinatorial version of algebraic geometry, or more accurately, a polyhedral version. And uh, I don't want to get too much into the details. Uh, I just want to talk about a few examples today. So the uh, analogs of algebraic curves in tropical geometry are graphs. So uh, with or without a metric. So let's first talk about ordinary graphs. So a graph can have uh, loops. It can have multiple edges between a pair of vertices. So combinatorialists would call this a multigraph. And the genus of a graph, it's simply its first Betty number. So it's edges minus vertices plus one. So if it's a planar graph, it's the number of faces. Um, and on a divisor on a, on a graph is just an element of the free abelian group generated by the vertices of the graph. And so the degree of the divisor is the sum of the coefficients. And so um, one of the <clears throat> starting points for, uh, for tropical algebraic geometry was the realization that came in the first in the combinatorics community and then was taken up by algebraic geometers that divisor theory on graphs behaves in a way which is remarkably similar to divisor theory on a uh, Riemann surface. Um, so there is a Riemann rock theorem and so on, but let's first talk about what linear equivalence is. Uh, so linear equivalence for divisors on a graph is generated by what's called a chip firing operation. So a chip firing operation is a uh, kind of an elementary principle divisor. So what you do is you fix a vertex on your graph. Uh, so this, the, the, I'm fixing the red one here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move uh, a what's called a chip. So just kind of a positive integer from this vertex to all neighboring vertices. And if there are multiple edges between uh, a pair of vertices, then I move that many chips. So the divisor obtained by firing this vertex V is going to be one chip at this neighboring vertex here, two chips at this vertex here, because there are two edges connecting. And then uh, however many chips I give away, uh, I put uh, the negative of that number at the, at the red vertex. So clearly the degree is equal to zero. And so the subgroup of the divisor group spanned by these uh, chip firing uh, divisors is what's called the uh, group of principal divisors. And then you do the same thing as uh, normal in algebraic geometry. Uh, the Picard group is the divisors, is the group of divisors modulo the principal divisors. Uh, then degree is well defined on the Picard group. So the Jacobian group is the uh, degree zero of Picard group, and there's the standard exact sequence. Okay, and so um, a theorem which is re really quite kind of impossible to attribute because it's it came together as a, it kind of grew as an understanding, not wasn't just uh, someone proving this is that uh, the number of that first of all the Jacobian group of a graph is a finite abelian group, and uh, the number of elements in the group is the number of spanning trees of your graph. So for example, this graph you can count has five spanning trees. And in fact, the Jacobian is a cyclic group of four to five. And so for example, uh, the Jacobian of a graph is trivial if and only if the graph is a tree itself. That is to say, if and only if it is genus zero. So that's the tropical version of the statement that the Jacobian of a Riemann surface is trivial if and only if it's a P1, if it has genus zero. Okay, so, um, uh, so now let's talk a little bit about metric graphs. So in a metric graph, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a certain underlying combinatorial graph, but now I'm going to put edge lengths along all of its edges. And when I look at divisors on a metric graph, I'm now allowed to put, uh, I treat the graph as a metric space in, a, in an obvious way, and I'm allowed to put points on the interiors of edges. So there's now going to be uh, infinitely many points on the graph. And so a divisor on such a graph is simply the, uh, an element of the free abelian group generated by its points. So what is the chip firing operation on a metric graph? Well, the idea is the same. You fix a point. So it can be a vertex, but it can also be a point in the interior of an edge. And then in every direction from that point, you move a chip um, and you move them all a certain equal distance, which you can also select. So for example, if you put a... Um, if you put a vertex, if this is your chosen vertex, you can 
uh, find some small distance epsilon and then just move one chip uh, a distance of epsilon in this direction, this direction, and this direction. Uh, and then you get some divisor, which also has degree zero. Uh, and so you take the, uh, the subgroup of the divisor group, which is spanned by divisors of this kind. So that's going to be the group of principal divisors. And then you do the same thing. You define the Picard group as the uh, set of divisors modulo the principal divisors. You may want to look at the divisors of degree zero. So that gives uh, the Jacobian group. Uh, and what's the difference now? Well, so um, the, the way to think about this is that the Jacobian of a graph is a compact group over Z. So that's a finite group. The Jacobian of a metric graph is a compact group over R. So that is to say it's a real torus. Uh, and in fact, it can be identified with H1 coefficients in R mod H1 coefficients in Z. So it's a real torus of dimension G. And in fact, it has much more structure than I'm uh, able to describe today. It's what's called a tropical principally polarized abelian variety. It has something called an integral structure. Uh, it has a dual torus to which it is isomorphic in some sense. So there are quite a few details that uh, unfortunately I'll have to skip. Okay. So um, now I, let's talk about our Kirchhoff's theorem for graphs. So Kirchhoff's theorem for an ordinary graph says that the number of elements in the Jacobian is the number of spanning trees, which is to say it's the number of uh, subsets of the edge set with a property that the complement is a tree. Now, it's easy to see that if you have a graph of genus G, then the number of edges you need to remove to obtain a tree is exactly G. So here we're summing over certain G element subsets of the edge set of the graph. Uh, now, the uh, Jacobian is a torus, uh, and the fact that it's a tropical PPV in particular means that it's, uh, it has a certain um, product on it, so it's a Ramanian manifold. So you can ask, what is the volume of this Ramanian manifold? And so the answer is given by this paper of uh, Ann Baker, Cooper, Burek, and uh, Shukri, uh, which is that uh, here's what you do. You just take this sum, uh, where you sum over all G element subsets of uh, your graph, such that the complement is a tree. But instead of taking a one for each such subset, what you do is you just take the product of the edge lengths that you're removing. So for every G edges that form, uh, such that removing them form is, gives you a spanning tree, you take a product of those G edges, uh, and then you add up all uh, of these volumes that you get. So it would seem for dimension reasons that the volume of the Jacobian should be the sum, um, but there's kind of a quirk here that the, um, when you translate the metric geometry of the graph into Ramanian geometry uh, on your Jacobian, the dimensions all double. So in some sense, the, uh, the unit of length on a graph is meters squared and not meters. So for example, if you have uh, a graph, which is a circle of uh, length uh, L, then the volume of that circle viewed as its own Jacobian is actually going to be square root L and not L. So that's just kind of a slightly unusual um, circumstance. Okay, so now I'm telling you that the volume squared of the Jacobian is a sum of certain sets, right? And so now you think about it this way. If I tell you that a certain polygon has a uh, perimeter A plus B plus C, you may be tempted to ask, well, maybe this polygon is a triangle and A, B, and C are the lengths of its sides. So the question that naturally arises is, is there some kind of way of representing the Jacobian of a metric graph, cutting it up into pieces, such that uh, this decomposition of its volume as a sum represents just simply this decomposition of the Jacobian into pieces. And so this is what's called the ABKS decomposition of the tropical Jacobian. So here's how it works. So, um, what we're going to do is consider the tropical apple Jacobi map. So you're mapping from the gth symmetric power of a curve to the gth symmetric uh, to the pic G. And it's exactly the analog of the algebraic one where you're just taking G points and you look at the line bundle that they generate, which I'm just identifying with the corresponding divisor. Um, now in the algebraic setting, this map has degree one, right? It's uh, onto. And uh, the uh, pre if you want to construct the pre-image map, so the locus of indeterminacy is precisely the uh, theta divisor. So it's the set of uh, line bundles which have a non-trivial section. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to understand the structure of the tropical Apple-Jacobi map. 
So here's how the structure works. So um, if you have a metric graph, um, then the symmetric product carries a natural cellular decomposition in the following way. So if uh, you have a set of points, a set of G points on your tropical curve, you just look at the edges on which those points lie, right? And so each uh, point is going to lie in a certain cell. Um, some of them might lie in several cells, which are in uh, indexed by G tuples of edges of your graph. So if you have a graph and you're looking at sim three of it, well, you can just say, okay, well, let me pick any three edges on the graph. Uh, I could pick the same edge twice. And then I'm just going to allow points to move along those specific edges. And that gives me a cell in the symmetric product. Okay, and so now uh, the main idea is that the um, cells in the symmetric product come in two flavors. Um, so I'm going to say that C of F is a break cell if uh, the edges, along which I am moving the points of my divisor have the property that their complement is a spanning tree of my original graph. So that's going to be called a break cell and all other cells I'm really not going to care about. Okay, and so what the ABKS decomposition looks like before I state the theorem, let me just show you the picture. Um, uh, what what uh, ABKS proved is that the Apple Jacobi map looks kind of like this. So this is sim G of your curve. This is pic G. So pic G is a torus. So locally, you can just think of it as Euclidean space. It's just this nice uh, manifold. Sim G is what's called a polyhedral complex. So it's something that's put together from, from these blocks. Um, <clears throat> and then the uh, break cells evenly cover the, uh, in sim G, even, evenly cover pic G. Whereas uh, the other cells that are not break cells are kind of sticking out and are uh, contracted by this map. So you can think of um, the other cells as being kind of the tropical version of all of those line bundles that the, all of those G tuples of points, which uh, have a non-trivial section. So this is the, this is the kind of the, the um, locus that you're contracting and the break cells evenly cover pic G. Okay, so in algebraic geometry, if you have a map of degree one, which is, uh, you know, the blow up of something, then of course that map does not have a section, right? Because if you try to construct the uh, inverse map, there's an indeterminacy locus. In tropical geometry, that actually doesn't take place. Whenever you have kind of a map of degree one, you can just take, uh, due to simple continuity reasons, you can take a section of this map. And so this is the this is the exact statement of the results of the ABKS, which in fact um, uh, were actually proved earlier by Mihalkin and Jarkov in 2008, is that the tropical Abel Jacobi map has a unique continuous section. So if you have an element of pic G on on a graph, every element has a unique preferred representative as an actual sum of points, which is cer certainly not the case in algebraic geometry. And so what um, they also proved is that um, this decomposition of, uh, so this map has a section and the image of the section is precisely the union of the break cells. And so the volume formula has a geometric interpretation in the sense that you can try to find the volume of the Jacobian, which is of course the volume of pic G because they're the same thing. So just one of them is a translate of the other by summing together the volumes of these cells. And so what they proved is that if you take a break cell here, then the volume of its image here is just the product of the edge lengths divided by a factor, which happens to be the volume of the entire Jacobi. Whereas if you have a cell, which is not a break cell, then it gets contracted by the map. So the volume of its image is zero. And so then uh, you can find the volume of the Jacobian by just adding together the volumes of all of the break cells. And so what you get is this uh, weighted sum. And then it comes with a coefficient, which happens to be the reciprocal of the volume that you're trying to find. And so then if you multiply out by this volume, you get volume squared is this sum. Okay, so these are the results uh, from, of, of ABKS. And so what I wanna talk about today is a version of all these results for the tropical print variety. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about double covers. So Yoav mentioned them uh, in his uh, talk yesterday. So a double cover of a graph for me would just be the naive notion. You just treat the graph as a topological space and you look at a covering space of degree two. Um, so any such cover is Galois, of course. Uh, and if uh, 
If I'm looking at double covers of metric graphs, I'm also going to require that my map be a local isometry. So all of the edge lengths in, in this graph are induced from edge lengths in this graph. Okay, and so it's an easy exercise to see is that, that if, this, uh, if the target graph has genus G, then the source graph has genus 2G minus one. So the numbers work out exactly as they do in the um, algebraic setting. Okay, so before we talk about metric graphs, let's just try to talk about uh, ordinary graphs. If you have a double cover of finite graphs, um, then this, these two graphs have Jacobian groups, which are finite groups. Um, and there's a, a, a natural way to define the push forward or the norm map from the Jacobians, which is essentially just take any point uh, and map it downstairs. So take any divisor and map it downstairs. Okay, and so um, a theorem that Yoav and I uh, uh, discovered last year, but which turns out to have been known in, in other, other language by him, um, uh, combinatorialists is that, well, we want to say in the algebraic setting, the prim variety has a, uh, the kernel of the push forward map when you have an eight tall level cover of curves has two connected components. And then the connected component of the identity is the prim variety. Now these are finite groups. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about connected component of the identity. So instead what you have to do is introduce a certain parity on uh, this kernel. And then the prim group is just the, uh, even subgroup of the kernel corresponding to this uh, to this parity. And then you could say, okay, well, this I've defined a certain prim group for a double cover of finite graphs. So what is the order of this prim group? Okay, and so this is the formula that we found uh, that uh, as I uh, as I want to emphasize was actually known before. By the way, if you ever prove a um, if you ever write a paper with a combinatorics result that you think is new, uh, when you post that paper, make sure to cross-list it on math.co. That will save you some possible embarrassment later. Anyway, so the, literally the next day after we posted it, um, Vic Reiner from, I think he's from University of Minnesota, pointed out that, that this result is known. Okay, so what we want to do is we want some kind of version of what it means to count spanning trees, uh, except that now instead of having a single graph and we're trying to find the order of its Jacobian. We're trying to find the order of the prim group, so the kernel of this F of a double cover. Okay, and so here's what you need to do. You need to count the number of odd genus one decompositions of your graph G. These decompositions are uh, uh, stratified by rank. And so each uh, a odd genus one decomposition of rank K comes with a coefficient of four to the K minus one. So let me explain what these odd genus one decompositions are. Okay, so first of all, um, how am I going to describe a double cover? Well, so this, if you just kind of give this as an extended exercise in your algebraic topology class, I'm sure the students would come up with something like this. So if you have a, a double cover of graphs, uh, what you first do is you choose a spanning tree for your target graph. So this will be in thick black. Uh, and then it's pre-image as a pair of trees. It's a spanning forest for, for the source graph. Okay, and so then all of the complementary edges uh, come in two flavors. Uh, there, is, uh, there are edges with the property that their pre-images are somehow trivial in the sense that, uh, for example, this black edge here, its pre-images connect uh, the same vertices on the same tree as they do down here. And then there are the blue edges uh, whose pre-images uh, are flipped. So for example, this vertex is connected to this vertex via this uh, blue edge. Uh, on this graph here, this vertex is connected to the corresponding vertex on the other tree via the blue edge, right? So um, essentially to specify your graph, you just have to specify your spanning tree uh, in uh, thick black and then uh, say which of the remaining edges are, are you going to color blue and which of them are going to be thin black edges. Okay, and so there's a natural way of identifying the set of choices you could make this way with H upper one of, of your graph with coefficients in Z mod two. Okay, so now here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to say, okay, now I have a graph of genus G um, and genus one decomposition of this graph is a way of removing G minus one edges from the graph. And so here's how this is going to work. So if you have your graph here, this graph has genus three, Let's try to think what can happen if I remove two edges on the graph. And if you play around with it a little bit, you'll see that either one of two things happen. If you remove two edges from the graph, 
either you have one or possibly several graphs of genus one. So either your graph falls apart into a bunch of cycles or it doesn't, or there's going to be a component of genus two and maybe a component of genus zero. And so a genus one decomposition of the graph is a way of removing G minus one edges from the graph such that what remains is a collection of cycles. And the rank of this decomposition is simply the number of cycles that you get this way. So removing this edge here and removing this loop is a genus one rank one decomposition. Removing this edge, this bridge, and this edge here, genus one rank two, this is not a genus one decomposition. Okay, so that's what a genus one decomposition is. Um, and I'm going to say that a genus one decomposition is odd. And only after we came up with this uh, terminology, we realized that we realized that that shortens to O God. So an O God is a genus one decomposition with the following properties. So remember that um, all of, we have a curve with some marked edges in it, and that curve has a double cup, right? So now imagine removing a pair of edges from this graph, uh, and let's also remove their pre-images here. And so now your double cover is restricted to this collection of cycles that remains. Now, it's a, a topological exercise that if you have a cycle and you have a degree two cover of it, well, either that cover is trivial or it's not, right? So the A, because, you know, there are two representations of pi one of Z into Z mod two. And so I'm going to say that a genus one decomposition is odd if the restriction of this cover to each of these genus one components that you get is a non-trivial cover. And when is it a non-trivial cover? Well, the answer is that if there's precisely an odd number of edges in each cycle that remains. So for example, here, there is an odd number of edges in this cycle. Here, there's an odd number of edges here, an odd number of blue, sorry, blue edges here that we're counting. This is not odd because there is an even number of blue edges along this cycle. And so if you look at the covers that you get from these three decompositions, um, the way you can tell is that if your um, number, if you have an ogod, if you have an odd number of edges in your cycle, then uh, the pre-image of the corresponding component, each of these components is going to be connected. Whereas if you have a genus one decomposition that's not odd, then this cycle here, for example, is going to have two pre-images. So this is the trivial cover. Okay, so an odd genus one decomposition is a way of removing two cycles, G minus, sorry, is a way of removing G minus one edges, such that the restricted cover is non-trivial on each connected component. Okay, and so uh, we can count the genus one decompositions for um, this cover that we have here. So uh, it turns out that there are eight of them that are odd of genus of rank one and four that are odd of rank two. So uh, C, C1 is going to be eight, C2 is four. And so I predict that the order of the prim group is eight plus four times four, so that's 24. Um, and so you can go back and try to count the spanning trees. This one we counted has five spanning trees. This one, if you want to count, it has 240 spanning trees. Uh, and so you take the ratio of these and you divide by two, because remember prim, the prim group is only half of the kernel. And so uh, you get the predicted result, that the number of elements in the prim group is 24. Okay, so it's so far so simple. And like I said, this is a result that was already known um, in, not in the modern language, but it's already understood about 40 years ago. Um, and so now what I want to do is I want to say, okay, so uh, let's look at the tropical prim variety. So now if I have a double cover of metric graphs, then you can try to construct the prim variety of this in the same way that you do in algebraic geometry, which is that you look at the push forward map, the norm map on the Jacobians, uh, you look at its kernel and you try to understand what that kernel looks like. And so um, there are two papers about this by uh, Jensen and Lennon and Len and Ullersch that, uh, so together they prove the following, that uh, essentially the same holds true as, um, the same statements hold true as, as in the algebraic setting, which is that the kernel of this map has two connected components. Uh, the connected component of the identity is a tropical principally polarized abelian variety called the tropical prim variety. And in fact, the principal polarization on it is exactly half the principal polarization that's induced from the, from the ambient Jacobian. And um, everything tropicalizes nicely. So I, I'm not really going to have time to talk about the relationship to algebraic geometry. But essentially, if you have a family of curves, so a curve over a non-Archimedean field, 
uh, then the um, you can look at what's called the Berkovich analytification of, 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 of your curve. Look at the Berkovich analytification of the, uh, of, of the Jacobian. And then if you look at the skeleton of all that, then what you get is the tropical print variety. So there is a direct relationship to algebraic geometry, which unfortunately I don't have time to explore. Okay, and so what I want to do now in my remaining few minutes is to just talk about a version of the ABKS decomposition for the tropical prim variety. So first of all, is there a form? Is there a formula for the volume of the tropical prim variety? And so the answer is uh, yes, and it's very similar to the uh, ABKS formula. So the order of the discrete prim group is a sum over all O gods of your graph, of your target graph, where each O god is weighted by a factor which is four to the power of rank minus one. And so what we proved is that if you want to find the volume of the tropical prim variety of a double cover of metrographs, then you just take the same formula, except that you weigh it by a uh, term, which is volume F, which is just the product of the edge lengths that you're removing every time you have an O god. And so again, there's this uh, strange situation that the uh, units don't really match up in some sense, that what you get is a volume squared, not the volume. Okay, and so again, um, the question is, so I have proven a formula for the volume of the tropical prim variety. Um, is there some kind of way of taking your tropical prim variety and cutting it up into pieces so that the uh, volumes of the individual pieces correspond to the terms in this sum? So the answer is yes, but uh, the way to do this is more complicated than, than uh, what you do with the Jacobian, uh, as you would expect. And the idea is that instead of looking at the abel jacobi map, I'm gonna look at what's called the abel prim map. So I'm going to look at the G minus first symmetric power of the top curve. Uh, and then I'm going to map it to the prim variety by just taking some divisor and mapping it to D minus the action of the involution on this divisor. And so to be extra careful here, you don't exactly map to the prim, you map to the connected component of the identity of the prim, of the kernel of the norm map, which has the same parity as G minus one, right? So for example, if you take a point minus the involution of that point, that always lands you in the odd component of the, of the prim, and not the even component. Okay, so um, there is a fol folklore result, which is that in the algebraic setting, uh, the Apple prim map has degree two to the G minus one. And so we're very thankful to uh, Sebastian Casalina Martin, who uh, took the time to write up an 11 page appendix to our paper, where he proves this, and a number of other uh, useful statements about the prim variety. So um, I encourage you to read our paper if only to look at his appendix, because I think it's marvelously well-written. Okay, and so um, our main result, which I'm uh, completely out of time now, is that the tropical prim map is what's called a harmonic morphism of polyhedral complexes of degree two to the G minus one. And so perhaps uh, instead of trying to explain what this is, I'm just going to show you a picture. Um, so remember in the, for Jacobians, the picture of what the Abel Jacobi maps look like is, is this. So you have cells corresponding to break divisors and you have all the other cells and these cells evenly cover the Picard group and all of the other cells are contracted. So in our case, the picture is a little bit more complicated but it's also kind of reasonable to understand is that there are cells corresponding to O gods and those cells cover your prim except that now you might have several cells uh, that are O-gods in the symmetric product over any particular cell of the prim variety. But if you count the number of cells that you have over any particular point, you're going to always get two to the G minus one. So there is a way of defining degree for these cells that are not contracted and the degrees are always powers of two uh, in the same way, in the way that this degree is locally constant in some sense. So if you have a cell, if you have two cells of degree two to the K meeting along a co-dimension uh, one cell, then if there's another one here, then the total degree here is the total degree here. And so the sum of all of the degrees uh, in the pre-image is two to the G minus one. So, uh, well, unfortunately, there's no short way of saying this, but um, I just say I have I'm completely out of time, that uh, if you have uh, a element of the prim group, then it has exactly two to the G minus one representatives of the form D minus Yoda of D, where you count those representatives with uh, certain specified weights. And so this is the tropical version of the statement that the uh, Abel prim map 
has degree two to the g minus one. Oh, so I think I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so is there any question? Mark? I have a question which is maybe a bit philosophical. So mm -hmm. do you expect that there is a way to connect the two results so that it's not a coincidence that the both the degrees are the same, but that in principle one could be used to prove the other? So that would, of course, be the ideal way to prove this result. You would say that first you prove that uh, this degree, this map has degree two to the g minus one in the algebraic setting then uh, degree is preserved by tropicalization in some sense. And therefore uh, this result also holds in the tropical setting. We tried to do this and the machinery has not yet been developed for it. So uh, we think that this can be done. Uh, in some sense, this is above my pay grade. So I think, I think somebody else should do it, not me, but, but um, yeah. So this, this, this is certainly something that's plausible. Um, I've talked to a few people, experts, and 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 they said that yeah, the, the, this is something that that sounds feasible. But our proof was is entirely combinatorial. You essentially just count how many pre images you have, and then as you move around, you make sure that the um, everything glues together nicely. So yes, there should be some general theorem from which this follows, but it, the, this the 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 techniques haven't been developed yet. Thank you. Other questions? I have only a curiosity. So uh, do you think that it would make sense to consider also ramified double covers? Like not directly? Yeah. So if you, um, so first of all, let me just say a few things. Um, <clears throat> before you consider ramified double covers, you want to consider all unramified double covers. And in tropical geometry, unramified is a more general uh, thing than being a free cover. So there is a collection of covers where uh, you can have uh, what you naively would think would be called ramification, where um, an edge might have one preimage or a vertex might have one preimage instead of two. But there, some of those covers are unramified in the tropical setting because essentially they are the tropicalizations of a tall double covers of curves. And so um, uh, this uh, theorem um, is actually true. I even uh, erased a comment because I thought I would extra. This, this theorem is also true for um, these unramified double covers, except that the kernel uh, that is now has a single connected component and the uh, principal polarization, um, there is a principal polarization on it, but it's not the restriction. It's not half of the restriction of the ambient one. Um, and so, we believe that all of these results also hold for the prim group for the prim variety of unramified double covers of curves. Um, we just haven't worked that out yet. And then if you have ramification, yeah, the natural question is, let's say you have a cover of tropical curves, which is ramified at exactly two points. Is that still a tropical prim variety? We don't know. I mean, um, I didn't make a list, but there are exactly three papers about the tropical prim variety at this point, at least two and the ones that I'm talking about. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of um, low hanging fruit and a lot of work that remains to be done. But yeah, so looking at, um, that's certainly a nice, um, I don't know, master's thesis program, look at uh, ramified covers and see if you can prove something about their tropical prim variety. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions, remarks, observations? Okay, so if not, we thank again Professor Zaharov and we go further on. So I ask the next, next speaker to prepare.